Hey everybody, welcome Hello. to our channel here with the Los Angeles Public Library. Um, yeah, hi, welcome um, to the Los Angeles Public Library's Your Author program featuring the amazing young adult fiction author, Emmy winning uh, TV writer and talented memoirist, uh, Sarah Saidi. Uh, we thank Sarah for the interview today and we thank the Library Foundation of Los Angeles and the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Fund for their generous support. I'm Amanda Charles, a librarian for young adults at Central Library's Teenscape Department. And I'm Lynn Nguyen. I'm the young adult librarian at Chinatown Branch Library. It is my pleasure to host the Your Author Series today, and I hope that you enjoy this program. Please feel free to use the chat box to communicate your thoughts, comments, and questions at any time. Today's uh, featured author is Sarah Saidi. Sarah Saidi was born in Tehran, Iran during the Islamic Revolution. She immigrated to the Bay Area with her family in 1982, where they lived undocumented and awaiting approval for citizenship for 20 years. Ms. Saidi worked as a creative executive for ABC Daytime. She now writes books for teens and TV for everyone. Her television credits include the ABC Daytime web series, What If?, for which she won an Emmy, the, Gold, the Goodwin Games, iZombie, Grand Hotel, and the Riverdale spinoff, Katie Keen. Uh, Ms. Saidi, um, welcome to our YouTube Live slash Facebook Live channel um, uh, with the Los Angeles Public Library. We have a couple of opening questions. Great, we're gonna, thanks for um, having me, by the way. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so uh, we're gonna ask a couple of opening questions and then um, we're, uh, you uh, had indicated that you were willing to do a reading for us, which we really appreciate. Yes. I'm facing my fear because I hate reading out loud, but I'm gonna do it. <laughs> well, it's a real treat. I'm looking forward to hearing your words um, from you. So uh, <laughs> what was the pivotal moment in your life when you realized that you were destined to be a writer? I don't know that there was, a pivotal moment, but I do remember as a little kid, I even before I learned how to write, I would pretend to be writing in cursive in the notebook that I had, and I would do illustrations, and I would, anytime anybody would come over to our house, I would tell the same story over and over again, and I would pretend like I was reading it out loud, even though there was not actual writing, and so I think I was, I knew from a very young age that I liked being a storyteller, and I don't think I knew, actually, when I was nine years old, I remember saying I wanted to be a screenwriter. So I guess at that point, I knew that it was, I don't know how I knew that that was a job and a career and a way that you could actually make a living. Um, so I always like was interested in writing. I was an avid reader. I loved watching movies. I didn't really decide that I was going to do it as a career until I was in my early 20s. And I was living in New York City. And initially, I thought I was going to be a journalist because that just seemed like a clear path to being a writer. Um, and I ended up being a production assistant on an indie film. And it was so insane and so chaotic. And the hours were so terrible that at that point, I thought, OK, if I want, I was thinking about quality of life and maybe eventually wanting to be a mom and having kids. And I thought the 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 least stressful job here is the writer because they they get to work on the on their own stuff, uh, own schedule, own hours. I wasn't really thinking about a financial stability at that point. Um, and then they sort of give their material to someone else to to create it. Um, and I think with with books, it's sort of the same idea. Is like you're not working Monday through Friday, nine to five. You're not commuting anywhere. Like a lot of the the lifestyle of a writer really really appeals to me. Um, and then it took me about another 10 years before I actually got paid to write. Um, but that was sort of like, you know, in my 20s, just trying, sorry, I'm outside and there's a helicopter flying by. Um, so wait for it to pass. LAPD, this is a very Los Angeles moment out here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I can so, hear it too. <laughs> yeah. So it was, yeah, it was basically just kind of thinking about the life that I wanted to try and have for myself. And also knowing that it was something that I love to do and that I was passionate about. Um, and then I'll also add, actually, because I'm a child of immigrants and because I'm an immigrant myself, anytime my parents did anything for me that I knew was a strain on their finances, it made me feel guilty, even though they never made me feel guilty. It was just the you know, complex that I had. And when I moved to New York, they had bought me a laptop. And so I really decided, like, they've spent this money on this computer. I need to put it to good use. Um, so that kind of started my 
journey and desire to be a writer. Thanks, and can you tell us a few of the major steps on your journey um, to becoming a writer? Yeah, um, so when I lived in New York City, I was always writing on my own, mostly working on scripts at that point and doing some prose writing as well. And um, I ended up getting a job working as an assistant at ABC Daytime in soap operas, which was not like a career path that I was looking to get on. I sort of just fell into it. Um, and then eventually, actually, they moved me out to Los Angeles to be a network executive. And I worked on the show General Hospital for a few years. And that entire time I was, anytime I would get home from work, I would be working on my own material. I would sort of sneak off during the day and take meetings. Um, so I had this plan that eventually I was going to be able to quit my job and be a writer. But I think one of the best pieces of advice that I got, which led to my first um, sale, was I talked to a coworker at ABC and I had decided at that point that I had enough money saved. I was going to quit. I was just going to pursue writing full time. And she told me, she's like, before you quit, meet with everybody you know in the Walt Disney Company and tell them that you want to be a writer and present yourself that way to them and um, see if they have any advice for you. And so I ended up meeting with a woman who was an executive at um, ABC Family, which is now Freeform. And she said, well, I'd love to read some of your stuff. And so I sent her a script and they ended up buying it. So it was like, it was such a validating moment for me to be able to quit my job and also say I'm quitting because I stole something instead of I'm just going to quit to pursue this pipe dream. And I think it was a really good piece of advice. And I think it's something that I'd like to pass on to other aspiring writers because sometimes you're embarrassed to admit that that's what you want to do. And you don't feel like you can say that that's what you want to do unless you're getting paid to do it. And so I think that if you can just have people see you in that way, because people up until then had seen me as an executive, I think it was, I mean, obviously for me, it, it changed everything because I finally got paid for something that I had written. And I mean, financially that was helpful, but if anything, it was just like so validating to know that I was on the right path. It's amazing. So does this mean you're going to keep writing and writing and writing until I have no choice and sometimes I don't even know that I'm that skilled as a writer but it's you know it's been um I think too I will say because it was uh it took a while to actually get to work consistently as a writer um I don't take it for granted like anytime I get hired to do something anytime I sell something anytime I'm sitting in a writer's room anytime I'm working on a book proposal I just remember how long uh, it took to get here. And so I think that I'm just so incredibly grateful to be able to, you know, do do something that I'm passionate about for a living. Like that never gets old. That is great. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is such a great story and so inspiring. Mm -hmm. I think everybody who wants to be a writer um, or who is a writer and wants to make a living at it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, We've had a couple of questions and we we're wondering if you uh, feel comfortable reading your book. Reading, I doing do. your book today. Yeah. So I'm going to read actually the epilogue of American Eyes. Um, so I don't think I've ever read before and it's titled An Open Letter to Myself. Um, so the idea of this is I'm writing a letter to Sara if she had never left Iran. So dear Sara who never left Iran, even though you don't technically exist, I've thought a lot about you. What if my parents had decided to wait out the revolution and the war? What if they hadn't had the guts to leave Iran and try to give us a better life in America? What if we got deported and I spent most of my adolescence back in Tehran? I've wondered how we'd be the same and how we'd be different. I imagine, <laughs> this line gets me, I imagine you're still witty and sassy <laughs> and that your Farsi puts mine to shame. Maybe you even gave in to societal pressures and got a nose job, or maybe you were far less self-conscious of your looks than I was growing up, since you lived in a country that puts far less emphasis on sexualizing women. I also bet you've written more books than me just with the hours you saved throwing on a headscarf to disguise a bad hair day instead of spending a ridiculous amount of time blowing out your curly, unmanageable locks. Or maybe you didn't feel as compelled to have a career or follow your passions in Iran. Perhaps our priorities would have been completely different. When I was busy applying for colleges, you, have, you may have been weighing the pros and cons of going to university versus getting married right away. 
Instead of considering undergraduate programs, you may have been considering potential suitors. I have a feeling your journal entries were more introspective and philosophical. Hopefully you didn't fill most of the pages lamenting the fact that the boy you loved didn't love you back. I wonder if you secretly had boyfriends throughout the years or if you went straight from living with Maman and Baba to getting married. I hope you had an opportunity to live on your own first, but it's quite possible you'd be the mother to teenagers by now. Are you content living in Iran? Do you walk the streets of Tehran and marvel at the architecture and haggle your way through crowded bazaars? Or do you go to sleep wondering about me? Do you think about what your life would have been like if you'd gotten to live in America? You've probably seen more of the world than I have. I wasn't allowed to travel out of the country until I was 20, but I bet Maman and Baba took you on family vacations to places like Barcelona and Paris and Florence, if those countries granted you a visitor's visa. Do you know how to cook all of my favorite Persian dishes? I always complained about eating Iranian food growing up, and now I do anything to eat it at every meal. I didn't take an interest in learning how to properly make tadig, this ridiculously delicious crispy rice, but I bet your Persian husband and children praised your culinary skills. I wonder where you were during the green movement in 2009. Did you stay indoors where it was safe or did you take to the streets with the other protesters? Did you chant, where is my vote, till you were hoarse? Do you know anyone who was killed? I'll tell you where I was on the day of the fateful election. I drove to a hotel in West Los Angeles to vote for your president. With my Iranian passport handy, I was allowed to cast a vote in a country I hadn't lived in since I was two years old. The result of the election may not have impacted my life at all, or if it turned Iran into a more progressive country, it might have made it less difficult for me to travel to places like Tehran and Shiraz and Esfahan. I practiced the night before how to write the candidate's name in Farsi. You may be shocked to hear this, but my Farsi is at a first grade reading and writing level. I'm essentially illiterate in my native language. After I finished voting, I returned to my car and got stuck at a red light next to a rowdy group of Iranian protesters and Shah supporters. One of them was frantically yelling at me to roll down my window. I thought she just wanted to warn me that I had a flat tire. I made the mistake of rolling my window down and she started screaming at me in Farsi. She said that voting in the election meant supporting a regime that sent young girls to be sex slaves in Dubai. I had no idea about sex slaves in Dubai. And even if I did, I didn't know how to debate her in Farsi. I was speechless. So I stared at the woman blankly and in perfect English, I said, I'm so sorry, but I have no idea what you're saying. You didn't vote in the election, the woman asked me, confused. What election, I replied. The light changed from red to green, and I could hear her fellow protesters teasing her for mistaking me for an Iranian. I don't know, I heard the woman say in Farsi. She sort of looked like she could be Iranian. While your country was in a political crisis and young people were getting shot at by the police, I was essentially passing for white. For about a week, I was glued to the news and wore a green wristband in solidarity. The green movement eventually dissipated and I stopped thinking about you and went on with my relatively easy existence. I concerned myself with career changes in the adjustment period of living with a boyfriend for the first time. I voted in elections that didn't end in protests. I voted in elections that did. I thought of you and the youth of Iran while marching the streets of my own city chanting, this is democracy. I mourned the loss of my grandma and wondered if I'd ever be able to travel to Iran to visit her grave. Maybe while strolling through the sidewalks of the Jordan district that she loved to visit, I would meet a woman like you. Over tea, we'd compare notes and be unsurprised by all the ways we are different. But hopefully we'd also stumble upon the ways we are the same. The love for our family, the pride in our culture, the frustrations with our culture, and how we both agreed that cooking gorma sabzi from scratch takes way too damn long. We would realize that finding common ground does not require living in the same country or even the same part of the world. And that despite our vastly different upbringings, there's so much more that connects us than separates us. And then maybe you'd be able to convince me to get my nose done. Love, the Americanized Sara. Thank you for reading that to of us. That's amazing. It's amazing that we get to hear it directly from you instead of us sitting there with the book and we're like, wow, the author just read us this prologue. Well, so it's really was nice for me too because the book came out a couple years ago and I, you don't mm -hmm. really like go back and read your own book very often. So it was kind of, mm -hmm. it's always like nice to revisit it because sometimes you don't even remember having written it. Um, and I feel like um, we were emailing about this earlier today, but a lot of the things in there now resonates even more with everything that's been going on in our country. So mm -hmm. it's it really fascinating, like in 2009, when the green movement was happening in Iran, and we were all so far removed from it, 
it was almost like hard hard to relate to and now mm-hmm. we're going through our own version of that um mm-hmm. and hopefully it'll lead to hopefully it'll lead to positive change i hope so it was it was really um powerful to reread your uh your letter at the end of the book um in, in light of everything that's happening now um so we're going to open it up to questions from the audience now. Um, if anybody uh, watching on Facebook Live or YouTube Live uh, has uh, some questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, and to uh, start things off while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I, I did want to ask you, um, uh, the one, I think one of the most powerful uh, themes in Americanized is the one at the uh, introduction to the book, which is um, when you're sitting at your kitchen table with your older sister and um, she reveals to you that you do not have a social security number, that you are not a citizen um, and that you could be deported at any time. Um, before that, you were an average Iranian American <laughs> girl, um, like living in San Jose and you had, you know, everyday worries that like a 13 year old would have like boys and this and <laughs> Um, I don't know if you were in Eden Hawk yet then or not, but I mean, like, it was, you know, very, oh, sure. very uh, relatable and average. And um, then suddenly, like, your whole perception of your life changed. What's it like to have that kind of change happen in your life? It, it was really crazy. I mean, I think even though I was dealing with smaller problems, um, I was definitely um, an anxious teenager already. So I think it just fueled my anxiety to know that, I mean, you feel so secure and stable in the place that you live in your home and to realize that that wasn't as stable as I thought it was. Um, But I would give a lot of credit to my parents because I think that they, they always downplayed the situation to us. And as a 14 year old, 13 year old, I, you know, I thought, well, if they're not worried, then I don't need to be worried either. So I think that they, they really tried to make us think like it's going to be fine oh we're going to get we'll get you social security numbers don't worry um and I think you know but but through the years too it's like as a young person there's things you want to do like for instance when I was in college like I would have loved to go study abroad but that just wasn't possible for me so along the way there's always roadblocks and that was really frustrating um but yeah I think I just tried to push the fear aside. I mean, one of the things that was really interesting in researching and writing the book was going back and reading my diaries from high school. And I'm so glad that I kept those because they, they were just so helpful to me and even like remembering the timeline of things. And I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that there's not very many references in my diary to us being undocumented. Like so much of what's in there is like about a friend I was irritated with or the guy that I liked or like what I, like the ins and outs of what I did that weekend. And I really think that that's a credit to my parents for making us feel like we were safe, even though we really weren't. And I think um, one of the things that makes the book so relatable to teens is how much it um, is the narrative like of a teenager. It's informed by your diaries, um, which is one of the reasons why I love to recommend it to our teen patrons at Teenscape. It looks like we have some questions. Um, It looks like uh, from Kit, did you read or consciously avoid reading other, quote, immigrant literature, uh, end quote, before and while you were writing your book? And do you have any particular favorite? I didn't. I, I tried to avoid reading um, other immigrant literature while I was writing the book because I feel like sometimes I have a tendency, like, whatever I'm watching or reading changes my voice a little bit when I'm writing. But there is definitely a lot of things that I read growing up. Um, my favorite is probably, uh, Americans, I think, pronounce it Persepolis, but it's Perspolis, and it's um, by Marjan Satrapi, and it's a um, graphic novel and it, about the revolution in Iran, and the two books, and it was amazing when I read it because, I mean, as much as I love my parents, they didn't really talk a lot about their experiences during the revolution, and so a lot of the things that I learned about that era came from that book and not from my mom and dad. Um, and it's just such a, she, she depicted it all in the most like mystical, beautiful way with her artwork. Um, and then I also love the book Funny and Farsi. And I think Americanized gets compared to that a lot, which is c- extremely flattering for me. Um, and then there was a book it, that I read in college by a writer named Tara Bahrampur called To See and See Again. Um, and that was, um, I wish that I was able to write my memoir in the same way because 
she described living here and growing up in America, but it all comes full circle when she travels back to Iran. So that was a big part of her book. And I haven't been back to Iran, but I always felt like, oh, it would have been nice if I, if I had gone back and writing the book. What's your, I, I'm curious to know, like, you said that when you read um, other books, you didn't want, or other immigrant uh, type of titles, you didn't want it to um, cloud the way that you're writing. What is your writing process like? Like, how do you get started on a book? Um, with this book, because it felt like we could tell, um, I worked really closely with my editor, Kelly Delaney, who's amazing. And I never wanted it to feel like too linear. And we didn't want it to feel like all the stories about immigration were clumped together. So we decided that it would just be various stories that some of them connected to being undocumented. Some of them were just about what it's like to be an awkward teenager. Um, and we kind of tried to figure out like a good way to pace those stories from beginning to end in the book. So it really started with just coming up with, these are the stories that I think are funny. These are the stories that I think are heartwarming. These are the stories that I think are going to resonate with an immigrant teen or a regular teenager or a teenager that's grown up in America. Um, and, and there was some stories that um, I thought about telling that she discouraged me from telling because they felt too off topic or, you know, and, one of the things you really have to think about when you're writing a memoir is, is, is this story that I'm telling my story or am I telling somebody else's story now? And there's a couple of things that I wanted to include that felt like, oh, this is me retelling somebody else's story. And that feels icky a little bit. And it doesn't feel like it's my story to tell. So we worked really closely together to figure out what, what felt like it was um, on topic for this one. Um, but usually my process when it comes to writing pilots or books is I'm pretty big on outlining because I like to have a nice roadmap when I start mm -hmm. writing. So I write pretty detailed outlines. Um, and then before that, I try and really like write pretty detailed character paragraphs um, and kind of have like broad strokes of the plot. And then I start outlining. With Americanized, I didn't really need to outline because I kind of mm -hmm. already knew what the stories were. So I, I mm -hmm. thought in that way, it was a lot easier. It's amazing. How long did it take for you to write Americanized? I think it took about six six months to do the first draft. Okay, so, that's pretty good. Uh, which is like, but I, I will add, I was working full time. I was writing on iZombie then. So I feel like it was just trying to find the. I like to say I would have written it faster if it was the only thing that I was doing. Um, but again, I think it was also easier because the voice is more conversational too than when you're writing mm -hmm. fiction. Like I didn't feel like I had to worry so much about like if things sounded very poetic because it was just me t like telling a story. Your and story. I wanted it to, mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted it to feel like it was kind of easy, an easy breezy read in a way. I think we have some more questions coming in. I'll let Amanda. <laughs> um, there's a question, um, uh, actually a couple uh, of questions comparing um, uh, writing scripts or uh, TV movie scripts versus writing books. Um, so I'm going to chuck them together. Um, okay. What's more fulfilling, finishing a book or finishing a TV or movie script and why? And also, um, which medium do you prefer and do you hope to write more of each? Um, they're finishing anything is very satisfying whether it's a book or a script like when you feel it and nothing ever feels completely done but i think that you know once you've cracked something and once you have it at a stage where you feel like it's ready for other people to read um that's just such an enormous you feel such relief um i i really love that i get to do both because i like different things about them um i would say with the books for better or worse you have more ownership over the final product um, because as helpful as an editor is, it's still like your writing and your words. Um, and so in that way, I love that I can, I can feel like, okay, what, if people like this, it's all me. If people don't like it, it's also all me. So that, that can be a little scary. Um, I think as far as working in TV, because I've never run my own show, um, I'm part of the staff and the biggest part of your job is making sure that you carry out the showrunner's vision. Um, and if you, I've been lucky that I've worked for people that I've really loved. So I like being able to, to help do that for them. Um, but I also really love that it's collaborative. So you're sitting in a room with a bunch of other writers, 
your, well, not anymore, I guess. Right now, everything is Zoom. But um, pre-coronavirus, um, just having the camaraderie and feeling like you're in the trenches together is something you really don't get when you're writing a book. You're so isolated. Um, so I, I like that I get to do both things. And I'd like to continue to do both. There's more money in TV writing, though. <laughs> I will say that. <gasps> Okay. And um, while we're, um, we're waiting for more questions to come in, I did want to ask one question, which I always like to ask young adult authors, um, people who write for teens is, um, you know, I mentioned uh, how much I love your journal entries from your teenage years. Um, they really connect uh, to your younger self with like an intimacy that many memoirs of adults remembering when they were teens just don't really have. Um, so the question I wanted to ask was, uh, what truths do you believe adults forget about being teenagers and how do you represent those in your work? Um, I think that sometimes adults can forget that when you're a teenager, you don't feel young. You, you do feel like you're a grown up. I mean, I remember feeling like very mature. I don't think I thought that I knew all that there was to know, but I didn't feel like I was as young as some people treated me. Um, and I always say too, like as a, writer it's like and when you're writing a memoir it's really important to remember the details of what happened but it's also really important to remember what it felt like to be there like what it felt like to be a teenager um and in reading one of the things that was kind of sad i will say about reading my diaries is i realized a lot of the things that i was insecure about when i was 14 and 15 i'm going on 40 now are still things that i'm like have i'm, I'm insecure about so you kind of think like wow how much progress have i really made in the last 25 years um so I think that it made me realize like that that part of me still exists and so it was just about trying to access it and writing the book um but yeah I, and I try when I'm writing fiction um right now I'm working on something that's a lot of it is like an email and text exchange between two friends and I try to not make them sound necessarily like teenagers because I feel like once you do that then it feels very artificial I'm just like writing them like normal people uh, normal adult people um because yeah I think when I was 16 I felt like I was pretty grown up and mature and it looks like Okay. Yeah, we have a question. Sorry, we have a question coming in from Valentina. Uh, Valentina asks, has being an avid reader helped you find your own voice as a writer? Have you always loved to read or did you become a big reader by being the coolest book club ever? <laughs> I, I will say Kit, who asked the question, I worked with on iZombie and he's amazing. And I will share a story about him, which was he was in Vancouver on set and when he came back we had covered his entire office with aluminum foil like every little thing and they're like down to the pencils and phone and everything and he got such a kick out of it and said he felt so loved <laughs> by us doing that so he's a wonderful person and valentina and i have been in a book club together for 12 years so and we're the I two people it. that I, I will say i think we have the best track record as far as we tend to read the book whereas most other people in the club don't um but uh have i always been an avid reader mm -hmm. is that the question i mean yes. 12 years 12 years for a yeah. book club i think that says a lot <laughs> yeah definitely um i've always been uh i've always loved to read um since i was a kid and i don't remember what val did was there another one <laughs> she <laughs> asked uh, to, has, the, has being an avid reader helped you find your own voice as a writer have you always loved to read and oh, obviously you said yes as a, as a child. Yeah, definitely. So. Um, I don't know if it's helped me find my own voice or not. Because like, like I said, it's like sometimes you really want to be careful about not replicating other people's voices too much. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think you just have to it, try and figure out like what what sounds authentic you and then it's also hard because when you're writing fiction you're not necessarily like Americanized is so different because it really felt like my own personality mm -hmm. um but yeah I don't think that there's writers that I try and sound like you know I, I'm really yeah. afraid of that in a way do you, I mean, you don't want to oh sorry I was just gonna <laughs> say I'm like I don't want to directly plagiarize anyone so you try and keep those voices out of your do, do you have any favorite like what are what were some of your favorite books that you've read as a child 
Um, it was funny. I was thinking about this because in high school, I feel like we didn't read a lot of books by um, POC writers. Like we read, there w- there weren't a lot of diverse voices in the mm-hmm. text that we were reading in school, but I think I subconsciously sought them out. Um, and I read a lot of, like, I loved Isabella Allende, probably butchering her last name. Um, in high school, I loved reading her. I was obsessed with, like, Water for Chocolate. Um, I loved Amy Tan. So I think it was, I think that I was going after those books to read about people's experiences being other or being immigrants without really realizing maybe that that's what I was doing because there was not a lot of books by Iranian authors when I was in high school. I feel like there's a lot of amazing young adult um, Iranian writers now, which has been so great to see. And um, it looks like we have a a couple of questions. Uh, One from... um, Let's see, uh, I'm not sure who this person is, C. Taj12, um, who is asking, what is inspiring you right now? And another one from Lauren that I'm gonna group in here with, have you uh, been able to write and be creative during quarantine? I have been able to write and be creative during quarantine. Um, at least I'm trying to, because I think the first couple weeks of it, I started having a identity crisis that I was suddenly like a stay-at-home mom with no career. And so I started writing a, working on a book proposal because I was like, I need to be doing something. Um, so I've been able to, to make time. Um, and what was the first question? Uh, what's inspiring you right now? Oh, um, you know what? I'm, I'm actually adapting Americanized right now and working on that pilot. So I've been watching um, Never Have I Ever, which I really love on Netflix. And then the other show that I've been watching that I, that I loved I don't know that I would say, well, yeah, I guess it is inspiring me as the Babysitter's Club on Netflix because I loved those books when I was a kid um, to the point where they used to have a, there used to be a show where it was just like four episodes and you had to actually buy, order the VHS tape to come to watch them. And I did that as a kid and I remembered feeling so sad the first time I watched an episode because it wasn't like the way I had imagined the books in my head. Um, but the reason I really love the Babysitter's Club is because I'm doing Americanized for Disney Plus and you can't get too edgy on on that streaming platform. You know, they know their brand, they know what they want. And I feel like what the Babysitter's Club does so well is that it's um, still like, it's very sweet and entertaining and it's not really edgy at all because it's geared towards tweens, um, but it still like has something to say. Um, and it's still like very focused on female camaraderie and female friendships without being too overly earnest. Um, so I've really enjoyed watching those shows. Um, and then there's a lot of things on my list to watch. Um, like I May Destroy You, everyone keeps talking about. So that's high on my list. I haven't seen it yet. It's good. Okay. Yeah, that's very high on my list, which I'm guessing is tonally incredibly different than the other things that I've <laughs> brought up. Um, so. Yeah, but there's, um, and as far as things that I'm reading, I've been stuck on the same book for a while because I've been having trouble getting into it. And I'm not, I won't say what it is because I feel like that it's not nice to say something negative, but I am not good at just like abandoning a book. So I feel like I have to get through it before I can move on to something else. Are you reading any uh, other books right now? Do you, or do you have any favorite authors from your book club that, for example, that you've read? Um, gosh, what did I just, I loved, um, home, home going, I thought was amazing. Um, and yeah, I think that was one of the, one of my favorite books that I've read recently. I loved, um, um, Little Fires Everywhere and Everything I Never Told You. I love, I can't wait for Celestine to come out with something new. I just think her writing is like, uh, for me, one of the things that I loved about those two books and I, really actually I enjoyed really enjoyed the adaptation of Little Fires Everywhere too even though it was different than the book was that I think you can you can judge if a book is good if you don't put it down to look at your phone and with Little Fires Everywhere and everything I never told you I was just completely like absorbed in the world and I never had that like itch to put it down and like see if somebody had sent me a text message um so yeah I'd love for her to come out with something new soon there's um, a lot of lo- uh, love in the, cr- in the um, comments. 
for mm-hmm. uh, Babysitter's Club. Like you yes, really started so something when you shouted out Babysitter's Club. Yes, um, that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have a, a question from Andy Howe um, saying, uh, what were your favorite books as a child? Well, the Babysitter's Club was like, I to the point where I was so obsessed with it as a kid that I would, um, this is like all obviously pre-Amazon, so you had to physically go into mm-hmm. a bookstore to get a book. And they came out every month. There was always a new one. So like literally like heart racing as I ran to Walden Books in the mall to see if there was a new one. And then if there wasn't yet, then you're like, I guess I have to wait until the next time my mom takes me to the mall. Um, and, and then, but at a certain point, I think when I was 11, my parents told me I had to start reading other books. <laughs> They're like, you're getting too old for these. This is unhealthy. Um, but I, I really love the Babysitter's Club. And then I read a lot mm-hmm. of like the... R.L. Stein books and like the kind of YA yeah. horror mm-hmm. books too. Mm-hmm. I thought those were really good. Um, and then definitely like we obviously read a lot of the classics. Like I was never that into, I was the 15 year old that read Catcher in the Rye and was like, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I should probably revisit it. Maybe I'll understand it on a different level now. Mm. Uh, well, speaking of your parents, since you just brought them up, um, I have a question here from Alex. He asked, um, how do you try and stay connected with your Iranian roots, given that you have lived in the USA for most of your life? Yeah, that's it's really challenging. Um, and I have really started to, when Americanized came out too, you really start to think like, am I, am I more, Amer- maybe I am more American than I am Iranian. Like I always thought I was more Iranian, but sometimes when I'm around other Iranians, I feel like I don't totally fit in. Um, I think now that I have kids of my own, I've tried to really make an effort to make them feel connected to my roots, like whether it's buying books by Iranian writers or children's books about Iranian kids or making sure that we celebrate the holidays together, like we celebrate Persian New Year and we decorate eggs together, things like that. And then before I had kids, I went on like a, a real kick of learning how to cook Persian food and trying to, you know, constantly calling my mom to ask her for advice on how to make a certain thing. Um, I haven't been cooking as much Persian food now because a lot of it does take time and it is very labor intensive. Um, but it, it's hard. I mean, I will say like one of the one of my biggest regrets in life is that I feel like I don't speak Farsi as well as I wish I did. And I have a pretty thick American accent when I speak it. And so I think because of that, I'm really embarrassed to speak it around other people. Mm -hmm. So I don't use that muscle enough. Mm -hmm. Um, But I keep thinking like, as my kids get older, it would be great to hire a tutor and then we can all take classes together. And I'm still fluent enough where I can understand it and I can speak it, but I'm just very self-conscious about the way I speak it. And my little brother and I talk about this a lot where there's, certain family members that we feel like we could have such a deeper conversations with if we could speak Farsi better than we can. And that's really, that's really hard because there's just mm-hmm. like, I feel like my personality can't come across the same way in Farsi because I just don't know how to express myself as well as I, I mean, I don't always express myself very well in English either, but <laughs> in Farsi, I feel like it's very rudimentary what I'm able to say. Mm. Have you so been that's, that's the goal. Oh, have you have you been back to Iran ever since like coming to America? Have you gone back? No, I've never gone back. So I came here when I was two and I didn't get a green card until I was 20. So theoretically, I couldn't have gone back before then. And then I just I don't know if it's just being an anxious person, if it, mm-hmm. and it's always felt like it was a little bit. I, I, risky, I, although I, I have I know people that go every summer and they say it's fine. Um, so I've always had like a little bit of anxiety about going back. My mom went back and my sister has gone back. Um, my dad doesn't, I mean, as much as he'd love to go back, he, he is too nervous. He feels like he'll go and they'll find a reason to keep him there. Um, but never say never. I'd, I'd still, I would love to go someday. Um, so one of the great things that um, you do in Americanized is you really convey your family's closeness and your love of your family. This is not on our list of questions, but um, it just, uh, I was listening to you talk and you think of it. Um, okay, you have the coolest cousins ever. Um, <laughs> your cousin, one of your cousins, I'm not, I don't want to spoil this, there are no spoilers here, um, took you to see your favorite author um, when you were a teenager. And um, I just was wondering if you could talk about 
what it's like to see somebody that you admire, to talk to them as a writer, and whether that had any impact on you and your writing career now. Yeah, I should have said that Ethan Hawke had like a huge impact on me as a writer <laughs> growing up. This is actually a really funny full circle story that could could have a much better ending than it does. But when I was 15, I was like totally in love, obsessed with Ethan Hawke. I loved Reality Bites and Alive and Dead Poet Society. He was my number one crush. And my cousin one day took me out of out of school for the day with my parents' permission. And she's like, I have a surprise for you. So she drove me to San Francisco and she wouldn't tell me the whole day what we were doing. And she took me to Ethan Hawke's book signing um, in San Francisco. And I was like, I think it was the first time I'd ever seen a celebrity in person, let alone somebody that I was like madly in love with. And he read a chapter from his book and we waited in line to get, you know, our book signed. And all I said to him was, I hope I can write like you someday. That's all I could say. I was so nervous. Now, flash forward, like, I guess what, 26, no, 20, 24 years later. And I'm doing a book reading and book signing for Americanized at Skylight Books in Los Feliz. And the reason the story should have a better ending is that after the book reading, one of my friends was like, guess who I just ran into outside of Skylight Books, Ethan Hawke. And I went up to him and told him like that I love his movies. Or, and I was like, Ethan Hawke was outside of Skylight Books the night that I was doing my book reading. <laughs> like it would have been such an amazing full circle moment if he happened to decide he wanted to buy a book that night and <laughs> to be there. So he wasn't, but I still think there's something very magical about the fact that he was in the vicinity of where I was doing my book signing years later. So he, maybe he's like my fairy godfather. <laughs> I think you should write him a letter and tell him about all I know. I really, I would have given him a book. I would have said, I, there's a whole story in this book about you, but someday, someday we'll meet. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, we have a question here from um, Liam. Liam asked, in American Eyes, you shared a, re a reflective letter you write to yourself. Um, and I, let's see, uh, and, and you have never left Iran. Reading it, was so, reading it was so beautiful. Do you still write these types of letters? Oh, this is, I, uh, Liam is a reader who sent me like one of the most beautiful, lovely emails a couple weeks ago. And it was one of those like, oh, this is why, this is why I wrote this book. Cause I didn't think anybody would care or be interested in it. And then you hear that somebody had a similar experience as you. And it just means so much. Um, I don't write letters like that, but I feel like I, I feel like everyone should, because even if it's not the same situation as, is the one that I had in terms of leaving another country. It's like, there are probably so many different versions of ourselves out there. If we had made different decisions or gone to a different college or, you know, moved to a different city. And so I think that there is something really like interesting about thinking of thinking of those people if they existed. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll write a letter to Sarah who never had kids. <laughs> What's your life like? <laughs> And uh, it looks like we have a question um, from Margaret, um, who is asking um, if your book is good for high school freshmen, girls especially. Uh, Margaret is a teacher. Yes, I think so. Um, it definitely, I would say that's probably the sweet spot as far as age. I think um, kids younger than that, maybe there's some things in it that are a little bit too mature. Um, but yeah, high school kids for sure. It's, it's what the people I meant the book for basically. Meant to write the book for. I do want to chime in um, as a librarian. This is a nonfiction book that I love to recommend to teens who are looking for memoirs. Oh, thank you so much. So I wanted to ask you, um, being that you, when when you found out that you were undocumented, and you know, given the the scope of today and how, for example, we have to deal with DACA out here in California. Um, what is some advice that you can give to our patrons out there or teens out there that may be living in fear that they may get deported or, you know, that they're undocumented? Like, what, what are some tips that you can give them? I mean, I think the t biggest takeaway that I wanted people to have from reading the book is that you do belong in this country. And don't let anybody make you feel like you don't. Don't let anybody tell you different. Um, I think 
I, you know, I, there is, there will be a light at the end of the tunnel. I think that was hard for me to see as a young person going through it. Um, and I think it's also a really hard time. I've been thinking about DACA recipients who um, are able to stay here, but I think it's really important for all of us to remember that they're not able to vote. And I think it's really hard when you're not able to participate in this country's democracy when so many of the decisions being made are going to completely impact your life. And that was really challenging for me because I wasn't able to vote until 2008. Um, so, I mean, one of the great things is that I think that there are other forms of activism. And I think uh, one of the things that should hopefully be inspiring to young people that are undocumented or have family members that are undocumented is that when I was going through it, it wasn't really something that we talked about and it wasn't something, it, it felt more like a deep, dark secret. Um, and as much as there wasn't, there's more political strife surrounding the issue today, I think that there's also a bigger support system. And I think that hopefully, hopefully they're able to take some comfort in that and knowing that even if, if they can't vote, there's a lot of people that are voting that um, have their best interests at heart. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Oh, uh, since we we're, uh, we're waiting on a few more questions, if anybody wants to ask questions, we're, we're running short on time, but I did want to ask mm -hmm. you, um, uh, you are adapting Americanized for television uh, with Reese Witherspoon's production company, uh, which you mentioned, and um, what's it like adapting your memoir for TV? Um, how, is it, uh, how is writing your story for TV different than um, writing it as a, a book? Well, uh, I guess I would say the biggest difference is that I, I'm taking more artistic license, obviously, with the, than I would with a memoir. Like, um, with a TV show, it's like, it's a family comedy. And so I feel like the, my family is kind of a little bit more of an exaggerated ver version of themselves. But I, I really don't want it to feel too broad or too stereotypical. So I'm really trying to be careful about that. But I was less nervous about having family members read the book. I'm more nervous about them reading the pilot because I feel like the book, they couldn't really, I mean, I think I showed everyone in a really great light, but I think that was also pretty accurate in terms of what our experiences were. Um, like I said, with the TV show, I'm taking more artistic license. So I'm a little bit worried that they're going to, that my parents or my siblings will read it and be a little offended or feel like, well, that's not really what I was like. Um, so I think that's the biggest difference is that you have a little bit more creative freedom with the show. And I think that I'm starting to, in some ways, detach as I'm working on it because it feels like I'm, it doesn't really feel like I'm writing about my own family, even though it is, and it's inspired by our stories and what we went through. It feels like it's, these characters are larger than life. Um, so hopefully they'll, they'll, I, I always say, I'm like, somebody needs to make a TV show about a family responding to a TV show that's been made about them because I feel like that is a whole other, you know, that is a whole other, uh, that, that has a lot of comedy to it, I would think. Um, so yeah, I think I, I have a little bit more creative freedom with the show. And um, lastly, uh, you won an Emmy. What's that like? <laughs> I always say I'm like I I did but I was a daytime Emmy which is still an Emmy but um <laughs> it was it was really exciting it was really exciting and unexpected and I think the best lesson from winning an Emmy was that I had worked at ABC daytime for a long time as an executive and I struggled and I was unhappy because I really wanted to be a writer and then I finally took the leap and left. And then ABC Daytime hired me to write a web series. And the web series is what I won the, uh, what the producer, the director, and myself all won Emmys for it. And um, I think it was just a great lesson. And like, you know, you're going to be, you might be working someplace that you don't love, or it's not your dream job, or it's not what you want to be doing, but eventually it could lead to bigger things. Um, so that was a really, yeah, it was good kind of validated my life choices in a way. I also met my husband through that job. So a lot of a lot of great things came out of a job I didn't really love. It's awesome. I don't know where Amanda went, but that's okay. <laughs> she got sucked at the wackle. That's all right. Um, well, you know, being uh, 
I, I, well, I wanted to ask you some more personal questions just because I, I love getting, yeah. oh, welcome back, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> we were scared. Um, do you have a, what's, you know, now that we're in quarantine, um, do you, what's your favorite takeout restaurant that you've been eating at a lot? Um, let's see. Well, we were like psychotically paranoid the first couple months of quarantine and we weren't getting any takeout. So it's nice that we've calmed down a bit. Um, I think triple bean pizza is probably one of our favorites. That's, that's one of our go-tos. Nice. And then do you have any favorite restaurants? Um, like before quarantine or before all of this, uh, did you have a favorite restaurant that you love dining at? Yeah, it's so funny to even think about eating at a restaurant it feels like such a bizarre foreign experience. Um, we, I, I love going to Sasabune in Glendale for sushi. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of our favorite sushi restaurants. And then in Silver Lake, I really like um, Bowery Bungalow is one of my favorite places. It's Mediterranean food and it's got really great ambiance. Nice. And um, being that you worked uh, like, you know, on TV and now that you're doing, do, do you have any favorite types of, do you have a favorite movie or TV shows that you love to binge watch? Yeah, I still love Reality Bites. It's still one of my favorite movies. And I was watching it the other night and my husband walked in and said, is this Singles? And I got so angry with him because I'm like, Singles, which is also like such a good movie that I love. But I was like, how have I been married to someone all these years who gets Reality Bites confused for Singles? I was very upset. Um, so I, I love that movie. It's still like, it's just, I love the kinds of movies that are very iconic of a certain time and a certain generation mm -hmm. and that are the kinds of movies that like, if you stumble upon it on TV, you're going to watch and you're going to still remember every line of dialogue. Um, I've been out listening to the, um, origins podcast on the making of almost famous. And that mm -hmm. has been really fun and really interesting. If like anybody needs something easy breezy to listen to. Um, but yeah, I love like. Cameron Crowe movies, like anything that just feels like um, you can check out a little bit. Like I think all of mm -hmm. us are looking for a little bit of lightness right now too. Mm -hmm. so maybe that's why I love the Babysitter's Club so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you do to um, meditate or to for self care? Like what do you do to take care of yourself, especially during this time? Um, I also watch a lot of Real Housewives on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big reality TV fan, and I think it's because you really can completely shut your brain off. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely, that's like my escapist television. Um, I'm not, I, I don't really meditate, but I have, I definitely just like, it sounds cheesy to say, but exercising has helped me get through quarantine. Um, just, we, we bought a Peloton, so I've beco I'm becoming a little bit obsessed with it. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, um, but it's just I don't know. Well, I don't know when anyone's going to be comfortable going back to the gym. So it's it's a good um, good form of escapism for sure, and um, also just writing helps too. Like mm -hmm. that that to me feels like self care because I feel like uh, sometimes you feel guilty taking time away from your kids, but just having those two or three uninterrupted uninterrupted hours to write you kind of get absorbed in a different world and I think as somebody who's very I've mentioned I'm pretty anxious and I mm -hmm. ruminate on things a lot and um, I tend to think of like worst case scenarios like getting to focus on something that takes me out of my own thought spiraling is very helpful. <laughs> are you uh, are you working on anything right now like what's your next big project or do you have a, any new books coming out or secretly if you can I talk about it or not. <laughs> you know, I've been working on something that we we got a, one publisher passed on it. So I don't know if it's anything that will see the light of day. But um, when I mentioned that those first couple weeks, I like started writing another book proposal. Uh, I, I've been working on something that's actually about because I've been thinking about teenagers so much right now in terms of especially high school seniors, like n mm -hmm. not getting to go to prom, not having graduation, mm -hmm. like not knowing what college is going to look like. Um, so it's a book about two best friends who are isolated from each other during a pandemic and it's their correspondence mm -hmm. with each other. Um, and then also like pro there's pros too in terms of, because one of the things that I think is interesting is like the things that you tell your best friend, but then the things that you also don't mm -hmm. tell them that the things, the parts of you that you do keep secret. So I wanted mm -hmm. to be able to see those perspectives. Um, so that's something that I've, it's just at the proposal stage right now, I've written like 60 pages of it. So I don't know if I'll finish it if nobody wants to 
buy it, but we'll see what happens. But it's it was really therapeutic writing it during during a pandemic. That's awesome. Amanda, do you want to ask anything else before I play this game? Oh, <laughs> actually, well, we only got a few minutes left, so. Um, we did have somebody ask about uh, when you realized you wanted to be a writer, which I think you uh, you want to just recap that. Um, and if you have any advice for people trying to break into TV, I'm sure we have some mm -hmm. people in our audience. Oh, we'd sure. love to hear about that. So the recap is that I don't think that I ha can say like this was the moment. I think I just always loved storytelling. And, um, mm -hmm. and once I figured out that it was something that I could actually feasibly do as a career, I tried really hard to pursue it. Um, and then uh tips for getting into tv i my best tip is to have a thick skin because you're gonna get rejected a lot i always say like i think perseverance is more important than talent in this industry because you could be the most talented writer but somebody could um pass on your work and then you could quit and give up and never write anything else again or you can be a pretty good writer who just keeps trying and keeps trying and keeps trying and i think the latter is more important um and then also just have Keep writing pilots, keep writing samples, because the stronger the sample, the more likely you are to get a job. Um, and then practical advice, I think it does, it did help me that I had, even though it wasn't a career path I wanted to be on, I at least had a stable career for a while. I just had to be really diligent about writing in my free time. Um, so I think it, it, it does help to have something stable to buy you time so that you don't feel like, I'm, I'm, anytime somebody comes to LA and says, I'm giving myself six months, to be a writer and get hired i'm like it took me 10 years like there are people where it took them six months or three months but that usually is pretty pretty rare thanks <laughs> thank you so it looks like we asked all of the questions from the audience and um being that we're running out of time i just wanted to play this quick little question game with you so we can get okay. to know you a little bit better so you can just answer it really quick and on the fly um and i'll uh, i'll let you know when we're done okay so okay. uh tea or coffee coffee <laughs> netflix or youtube netflix phone call or text or texting texting when people Sushi. call me now, I'm convinced that like someone's died. Like I'm like, why are they calling me? What's happening? It's an emergency. Oh, <laughs> uh, sushi or kebabs? Oh my god! <laughs> um, kebab, but sushi, both. Someone needs to do a hybrid. <laughs> oh, uh, Facebook or Twitter? Twitter, I deactivated my Facebook a year ago. It was like the best oh. thing I ever did. Sorry for, I know we're on Facebook and YouTube right now. Sorry, guys. Uh, um, okay, how about this? Twitter or Instagram? Instagram. Oh, okay. Uh, ice cream or snow cone? Ice cream. Work hard or play hard? Work hard. <laughs> Jogging or hiking? Jogging. Hamburger or tacos? Oh, that's also hard. Tacos. <laughs> <laughs> we, know you, we know you like to eat good food then. That's what I've gathered. <laughs> I know. The food thing is really hard. You're really stumping me with these questions. <laughs> uh, e-books or, right, or, e e or audiobooks or audio books? Neither. Regular books. I don't do audio books and I don't do e-books. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Uh, ocean or mountains? Mountains or ocean. Nature gives me anxiety. I said that. Was <laughs> <laughs> I like okay, so like no you. nature. <laughs> I like buildings, <laughs> architecture. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, uh, last one TV shows or movies? TV shows. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah, that was super fun. Um, thank you so, so thank you, for, guys. Thank, so you, great. thank you so much for for giving your time and for spending your day with us today on Ask the Librarian. I mean, on uh, your author series. <laughs> Sorry, it was on. My pleasure. No, it's okay. Thank you so much for doing this, and I can't wait to visit you guys in person someday soon. <laughs> thank you so much, Sarah, and to everybody yeah. watching. 
Um, we want to remind you that you, your author will be back uh, next week, July 24th, with uh, Helena Kuri. Um, and uh, that's, again, on YouTube, our YouTube channel, or our Facebook page. Thank you so much. Thank and we hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Okay, everybody, be safe. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Bye.